Another awesome EMS series of training. Uh, tonight we have Dr. Meyer Levy, he's a vascular and thoracic surgeon. He's worked in a level one trauma center for the past 15 years. He will also discuss clinical assessment of vascular status, including anatomy, and how to assess patients' chronic vascular disease, as well as uh, diabetes, obesity, and change of vascular evaluation. He will also discuss assessment of vascular injuries, including signs and symptoms of limb threats. So, thank you, Dr. Miley, for coming tonight, and uh, I'll further you about At least you're back! All right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for having me down here. This is great. Um, I really appreciate to um, share some things with you. Um, Sammy is. Um, we appreciate that you have given her a new home, so that's great. Um, what I do is uh, vascular surgery. I trained in cardiac surgery and thoracic surgery and um, board certified in cardiac and vascular surgery. Uh, I worked at Lea Valley Hospital Network for over 15 years and now I work for the past five years in um, a division of the main hospital up in the north of, um, well, not Pennsylvania, but Allentown, where it's an entirely different patient population. So some of the things you'll see is examples of that particular patient population. It's a mixture of uh, transplants from New York City into a rural environment, uh, economically very challenged, and a um, lot of drug abuse, a lot of uh, underserved medical uh, areas that, that uh, we are faced with. So let me just make sure this works. So the, the, the thing, I think for all of us is that we always have to try to make someone stay a little better. And um, I saw that in the hallway in the operating room, uh, I guess the kid was going to the OR and I thought it was really sweet. So I picked that out. So what we do as vascular surgeons, um, we is assess and treat all vascular conditions outside the chest. Anything inside the chest is really the, the, the territory of the cardiothoracic surgeons, whether that is the cardiac injury or whether that's an injury to the thoracic aorta or the injury to the um, subclavian artery inside the chest, for example. Those are cardiothoracic um, traumatic injuries or, or um, uh, surgeries that have to be performed. Anything outside the chest is ours, and for the, for the better, for the worse. So we're gonna go a little bit about over vascular anatomy, vascular assessment, um, just some basic, um, you know, uh, things that become important when you're out in the field and you, you actually see these patients and you are the first responders that have to deal in, in very few minutes, assess a patient, how, how ill they are. And then we talk a little bit about uh, vascular disease, risk factors that also can help when you actually see these patients very quickly to see what kind of you know, list you have to run through real quick to see you know, how to assess the, the, the uh, problem that's currently having. Uh, then we go through traumatic injuries and you see some gross pictures and acute life and limb threatening emergencies and their treatments and then chronic non-emergent vascular conditions and then I still at the end I have some case presentations. So, you know, as you all know, um, the aorta is the biggest blood vessel, it comes from the heart, it goes up in the upper chest and then divides into the um, the uh, subclavian arteries, the car carotid arteries, and as, as you go out into the periphery, the arteries get smaller. So that's why um, when you are feeling pulses in the distal circulation, the radial or the ulnar arteries, you may not find the pulse. And sometimes in people who are older or have diabetes, um, or just by body habitus, uh, peripheral pulses are very, very difficult to feel. Um, in the hospital for us, when people say they feel pulses, it's a very subjective thing. I sometimes feel my own pulse. And, you know, I, I could swear that it was a patient's pulse. And I kind of always have to step back and say, you know, what's the situation here? And I've been fooled. So be very careful when, when you document pulses. Um, it, it may be your own because you may have healthy circulation in your fingers and the patient doesn't have healthy circulation in their feet. So that's what you may pick up. 
The common tremolo artery is a big vessel, five to eight millimeters, you know, up to 10 millimeters, so it's a centimeter in diameter. Um, that's a good vessel to feel for a pulse. The carotid arteries, as you probably also know from your, from your ACLS and your, your basic life support, your seven to nine millimeters, also a large artery. Both of these vessels are also not necessarily easy to, to palpate. You know, you have a big neck, you have somebody who works out a lot, somebody um, who um, has a short neck. Um, it, it, they may not be easy to, 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 to palpate. Same in the groin, femoral arteries. Um, so these are the two arteries that you would focus on in people who are, uh, you consider hypotensive. And as you all know, you know, by, you go by in the common femoral artery and, and the, in the um, uh, carotid arteries. Um, again, you know, most of people with peripheral vascular disease have um, different levels of vascular disease. You know, smokers most of the time have, um, let me just, which button do I press for the pointer? This one? Oh, what do I do? Oh, sorry. This one here, okay. Most, um, most people with tobacco abuse have what we call aortoiliac and femoral popliteal occlusive disease. So hypertension, uh, cholesterol, um, tobacco abuse affect the larger vessels in the body. Also subclavian arteries can have people with subclavian artery stenosis or occlusion. You take a blood pressure on one side, it's um, 80 over 40. On the other side, it's 140 over 70. Um, so the other lesson of this is take the blood pressure in both arms. Um, diabetics, however, usually have small vessel disease. So they start with pathology in their toes, injury to their toes, ulcers, nail bed infections. Um, they have ankle ulcers. Um, they have occlusive disease of the tibial perineal trunk, which is the trifurcation of the of the arteries below the knee, where the popliteal artery then divides into the anterior perineal and posterior tibial artery, and that is a pathology. And then you have the diabetics who smoke, which is even the double whammy, because there you really get fooled, because uh, you, you, you don't get peripheral pulses, and you have a, a multiple layer of disease, so that their chronic presentation of vascular disease may be much more severe than you have in a diabetic or just a, in a smoker. So again, um, just a little bit more here, um, not really that much important um, than the mesenteric arteries. You have the thoracic aorta, then going down to the gastric arteries, celiac trunk, splenic and hepatic arteries. Following this, you have the um, renal arteries, and then below that, you have the uh, an inferior mesenteric artery di bifurcating into the iliac arteries, hypogastric arteries to the pelvis, and then down to the leg arteries. So the vascular assessment when you talk to people, and as we always learned in medical school, and you learned in your training also, is you talk to the patients. If they can still, if they can talk, then the most important information you really gather at that point is, is the history, you know, what happened to you. And uh, there's some key questions you can ask them, you know, the past medical history in terms of vascular assessment, important to know whether they have any uh, coronary artery uh, disease, did they have ever any coronary artery bypass grafting, did they have any in their, in their heart, um, you know, do they have a history of diabetes? Uh, do they have a history of leg bypass surgery, kidney failure? Do they have a dialysis access? You know, it becomes important when you either start an IV or you take the blood pressure. You don't want to take it over the, over the dialysis access. And uh, the other thing is anybody with a dialysis access usually has some type of a, of a steal from that dialysis access into the graft, meaning that the circulatory assessment is not the same on the side of the graft as it is on the non-graft hand because blood goes through the fistula and steals blood away from the distal circulation. Everybody has that. Some people have it a little bit more than others. Okay. In terms of the... In 
terms of the in terms of the physical examination, um, you should try for finding peripheral pulses. Um, if you don't find them, I wouldn't get too upset about it. Uh, as long as they can move their toes and move their feet and move their hands, um, there's always some circulation going in there, so the leg isn't dead. And I'll show you some dead legs, and then you absolutely know what you know what to look for. Um, have they had any mutations in the past, um, which is an indi indication of either having had a traumatic injury to the, to that extremity or having had an amputation because of vascular insufficiency? Do they have leg ulcers? And then the question is, what kind of leg ulcers? Are there venous? Um, are there venous ulcers, or arterial ulcers? Um, presence of gangrene on the toes. Um, you know, dry gangrene, is it infected, is it draining, is it purulent, any of those things. Um, you know, we get people who come in with maggots, they have their leg, legs wrapped in, in paper towels and, you know, God forbid you take it off, you know, you don't know what you find underneath it. But they come in with maggots and the maggots actually keep all this pretty clean, um, which is great, but it's, you know, it's kind of gross. Um, <laughs> Then, you know, if you can, if you have the, the, the time, if you have the, the quietness, because you do need to really listen, arterial breweries, which comes from a flow abnormality of the, of the arterial flow, either it's secondary to a calcific plaque or a, a blockage, a stenosis, so you get the swishing sound, and, and sometimes it can even be a squeaking sound. Uh, mostly heard in the carotid, sometimes you can hear it over the femoral arteries. Um, hard to do when you're in a kind of a busy environment and people are hollowing and doing things and you try to get the patient to the hospital. Um, another important thing is when they complain about calf tenderness or calf swelling, do they have a DVT, a clot in their deep veins? Um, and then also naturally in their assessment is, you know, do they have large wounds in their legs and their arms, um, on their buttocks, for example, pressure ulcers, which means they've been, they've been probably non-ambulatory for a while, either in bed or lying in, in, on, on the floor for even days sometimes. And they get breakdown of the skin and uh, infected, uh, infected necrotic ulcer. The risk factors for all of this is the usual lineup, the usual um, uh, suspects. You know, diabetes is a big one. Uh, diabetes and tobacco is, is one of the most terrible, detrimental combinations you can find. Um, alcohol, obesity, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, being a male, family history of heart disease and or stroke. So, there, there's, there's a whole different realm of things one can talk about here. You know, there's acquired partial complete blockages where, where people have problems walking or walking a certain discan, distance. We call that claudication, calf claudication. Uh, they tell you, well, doc, I can only really walk about a block before I have to stop. And when I stop, then what happens is that, that the pain goes away. And as soon as I start walking again, pretty much right after about a block or so, it starts hurting again, the leg starts cramping up again, I have to stop again. And it's predictable. It's not like it's one day it's happening, another day it's not happening. It happens every time they do this. And this is called calf claudication, and it's usually secondary to a partial or complete blockage of the femoral artery, the superficial femoral artery. Is it usually bilateral or unilateral? It can, it usually, it, well, it's, um, you know, it's a good question. It's most of the time it's unilateral. You know, uncommonly you have it bilateral, but there, there are people who come in and, and say, you know, both of them start um, cramping up at the same time. And we always ask, you know, is there one leg more than the other? And usually there's a little bit of a difference. Um, claudications can involve the arms or the legs. So they say, well, doc, I work at uh, FedEx and I have to lift the packages up and I smoke two packs of cigarettes a day and um, it really starts, my left arm really starts hurting when I hold these packages and I have to put them on the conveyor. And behold, the blood pressure on the right is 80 and on the other side is 140. You don't feel a radial pulse on the right, you feel a great radial pulse on the left. And uh, that is also reproducible. 
Um, so this is probably subclavian artery stenosis. Maybe there's a brachial artery stenosis. But most commonly, these are the main inflow vessels into the extremity. And the superficial femoral artery, um, or the common femoral artery, are the main arteries to the lower leg. So when they get calf claudication, the blockage is usually higher up. That could be the common femoral artery or the superficial femoral artery get claudications usually from the tibial arteries. You know? um, when you talk about the arteries to the brain, carotid arteries, big thing is stroke, you know, or what we call transient ischemic attack, uh, TIAs. TIAs is, are, 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 is an event where, where for a short period of time the brain doesn't get enough blood. And this can be either an ischemic event or it can be an embolic event. An ischemic event, what happens is that they suddenly lose vision in one eye. Um, if it's the left side of the brain, a lot of times they get garbled speech or their loved ones, families just say, look, I, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, or they can't even bring a word out. And then after two, three minutes, it goes back to normal and they're fine. And some of these people are bothered by it. Other people go on and come back, come to the ear the next day and say, I had that event, you know, and then we'll check it out. So um, stroke, 50% of the people that have a stroke will have a completed stroke. Uh, the other 50% may get lucky enough to have a TIA, so that's a reversible event. But you have to take that seriously because they can have another event very quickly. You know, I saw a lady, and it was, it was very sad, a Romanian lady who takes care of her, of her uh, disabled mother. Um, and she's been smoking for like 600 years and came from Romania and, and is very, you know, fiscally responsible and doesn't want to spend any money on anything except for her mom. And uh, she came to the hospital with a TIA, left-sided, left hemispheric TIA. And in the course of the workup, we found that she had severe bilateral internal carotid stenosis, you know, 80% us on both sides. And, um, you know, I got so worried, I said, you know, we really need to fix this for you. And I had a Romanian neurologist talk to her so that I could speak in their, in their home language so that, you know, she would feel more comfortable. And she said, no, I got to go home and take care of my mom. And she signed out and then, you know, I called in the, I called at home and she said, well, how much is it going to cost me? <laughs> I said, I don't know. You know, and it's not really an issue here because uh, if you don't get this fixed, you're not going to be able to take care of your mom and then you're really screwed. So um, she yet has to call me back to come to the office. Um, there are three arteries, three major arteries. The, super the, super the celiac artery, which goes to the stomach and the small bowel, and the hepatic artery that comes off the celiac trunk. And then the superior mesenteric artery, which is the main artery to the small intestine and also part of the colon. And then the inferior mesenteric artery, and you'll see that again in, on a case study, um, where, uh, which supplies the, the, um, the sigmoid colon and the, and, and the rectum. Now these three arteries, the, the rule that we had in the past was when, any of, when two of those three arteries are occluded or partially blocked to about 70%, then they need to be opened up because that can cause major events. Um, the events we're talking about is an ischemic bowel, either a uh, small bowel, and uh, when you have loose 12 feet of your small bowel, then uh, you're dead, essentially. You, you have a very s small chance of surviving that. And therefore, it's important to, to read the, the history and the uh, stories that these people tell you. There's one thing that we call fear of food. Chronic mesenteric ischemia presents with people that have lost weight, about 30 pounds or so, over the past you know, few months. And they say, Doc, I just, I, I can't eat. Every time I eat 30 minutes afterwards, my abdomen, my belly starts hurting so bad, you know, I just don't want to eat. And they lose 20 pounds, 30 pounds, and that's a dead giveaway that you really have to work that up. I mean, other reasons for weight loss also have to be considered, but usually the postprandial pain and the fear of food is, is, is associated with chronic mesenteric ischemia. 
Acute mesenteric ischemia is even more dangerous because that's an acute event that can block the whole supermesenteric artery, an embolic event. People go into rapid AFib, um, you know, PAF, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which has been unrecognized as where a big clot goes into the supermesenteric artery. They come in with dead bowel and um, most of these people die because uh, th that's, that makes them severely acidotic. They go into, into shock, they go into uh, renal failure, and um, if you take the whole small bowel out, very few people really live through that. Um, and then you have the abdominal aneurysm, which is not an occlusive problem, but it's more a problem of um, dilatation of the abdominal aorta or any large blood vessel for that matter, whether it's the common femoral arteries or the abdominal aorta or the thoracic aorta. And the major complication of the uh, abdominal aneurysm is rupture and death. About 70% of the people who come in with a ruptured aneurysm die. The numbers have changed a little bit, but overall it's still a pretty fatal event. And then we have um, acute traumatic injuries, whether they're blunt or they're penetrating knives, guns, you know, people fall out of windows and do all kinds of crazy stuff. So when you evaluate these patients, again, are they alert? Uh, what's their color? You know, do they have this pale color? Do they, do they look kind of... We have this thing in the hospital where when I walk into a patient's room, I said they meet the eyeball sign or they don't, which means you know they they are they just really bad looking or they they okay. And with experience, um, you know, on on doing these things, you walk into an apartment and you can kind of scan out and and without really. Uh, judgment at that time, you can see who, who really is, is doing badly and who is probably going to be okay. Now that can change very quickly, but at least initially, you know, you get that idea. Do they move every extremity? Uh, can the patient move their toes? And that's for us is always the most important thing. When we get a call from the emergency room, doc, there's somebody that have a really bad looking foot and it's blue and it's, it's cold and uh, I can't feel a pulse. And I can't feel a pulse from the emergency room is to me like, yeah, whatever, you know, because it could be anybody who feels the pulse and it's there or it's not there, it doesn't really matter to me at that point. If I ask him to take a Doppler probe, which is an ultrasound, uh, that's even more risky because you have to have a certain skill to do that and it's not reliable. So the best, easiest thing is always to ask, can they move their toes? And if they can wiggle their toes, you're okay. <laughs> You have some time. You have, even if there is some kind of injury that you can document and prove, you have about four hours before the dead, is, the, the, the leg is really a, a problem, you know, in terms of major metabolic um, problems such as um, rhabdomyolysis, rhabdomyolysis or limb loss. So peripheral pulses we talked about, um, if they're not hypotensive, you may be able to feel an abdominal pulsatile mass. Maybe they have an aneurysm. Um, maybe it's, it's a rupture ring and uh, you just came in time, or maybe the patient's never known anything about having an aneurysm and you're the first one to find it because the family doctor never really felt the belly um, burn. Um, blood pressure, hypo or hypotensive, both arms equal. Um, wounds, acute injury versus chronic ulcers or, or gangrene. So if they have any wounds, the question is, are these acute wounds? Did something fall on them? Um, are they all diabetic wounds that they just haven't addressed or they've been taken care of properly? Uh, those are all the things that go through your mind. Have they had any amputations? If you have penetrating trauma, somebody got uh, stabbed or has a knife uh, or got shot for that matter, you always have to look for the exit site. You never really assume that it's stuck somewhere and you always have to turn them over. You always have to take a look. And then leave the knife in the body. Okay? So this was actually... Um, Somebody who came in and, and uh, the, the, the stories usually go like, oh, Doc, I don't really know, I, I wasn't doing anything. You know, it was like three o'clock in the morning, I was selling water on the side of the road and, you know, there was this person coming by and blah, blah, blah. Uh, this actually happened in the kitchen. I guess he's a baker or did something with that knife. 
So they brought him in and um, you know, they left it there, which is the right thing to do. And he actually got very lucky when I asked you what was the injury. Uh, you can imagine, so that injury is, is kind of right, could be right, it could be nothing, because the angle is just really shallow and it could have just gone into the rectus. It may have pierced the rectus sheath and went into maybe momentum or a piece of small bowel. Um, it could have hit the mesentery and caused some bleeding. Uh, what else is there? Hmm? Well, that, I think that's he had a paniculectomy. He, I think he was bigger, and that took part of his part of his um, uh, uh, panis out. So that was elective surgery in the past. But uh, where the knife is, you know, you have the. You have the iliac crest here, you have the pubes there, so it's right in between. What goes in between there? You know, there's, there's iliac artery, there's iliac vein. Um, you know, there's, uh, it's a little bit, it could be femoral artery, but you know, you could have some major problem in here. Um, but lo and behold, he didn't have anything. They pulled the knife out and um, what I'm showing you next has nothing to do with this case. I'm just using it to illustrate something. Um, that we, we will take it out in the operating room, um, but this was a different case. This was uh, this was a different case. <laughs> um, so this is a gunshot wound to the right, to the thigh. Gunshot wounds, as you all know, you know, there's pellets and it goes all over the place, and. Um, so there are multiple, multiple uh, wounds here. They've been tagged also with paper clips just to, to make sure that they're, they're recognized. And then you have to look for it and actually uh, find out what the underlying injury is. You know, I've had uh, cases where the patients were very large and we, we couldn't find the bullets. I mean, even by looking in there, and, and honestly, I, I'm, there was, I remember one from Lehigh Valley where the guy got shot in the right thigh and he was very large. And um, we looked for it and couldn't find it and there was no arterial injury. He had a pulse in his foot, he had a pulse in his thigh. But in the end, the bullet had lodged right in the bifurcation of the superficial femoral artery and the deep femoral artery. It had injured the deep femoral artery. And that was very, very hard to find. And even though I had looked, I had missed that. And we had to take them back and then, you know, take it out. So these can be very, very difficult to, to get right. And it takes some experience. And it also um, sometimes requires you taking them back to, to find what you need to actually solve their problem. Because the guy I had was still bleeding. And that was kind of the problem that ticked us off, that you had to take them back and take another look. So gunshot wounds are, are terrible because uh, you know, the, the pallets can go anywhere and uh, the injuries are really devastating. The soft tissue injuries are devastating and uh, very difficult to treat. Uh, this is the same guy, he got hit in both eyes. Um, This is an AK-47, and uh, as you can see, there's a shunt here. This is called a higher shoulder shunt. This is when you have total separation of the of the uh, the, the arteries. They're, they're they're torn apart, and you have a gapped area where you can't primarily repair them. And this is a dirty environment, so until you actually have, um, it can take them back and electively try to salvage the extremity, you put a temporary shunt in so that there's arterial flow to the distal portion of the leg. Because all this is, is, is gone. You know, I don't really know what, uh, whether this is a separate injury or the same injury, but uh, the key here of this slide is that we use shunts that go from one, from, from connects the arteries so that at least you have perfusion into the, into the lower limb. So this was um, a guy my partner and I did. Uh, it's the usual time in the Poconos. You know, it's a holiday. Everybody's getting really happy. And uh, then being happy also means you get drunk. And when you're drunk, you start going after your girlfriend and try to abuse your girlfriend who uh, is running away from you. And uh, then he put his arm through the car window because she was hiding in the garage. Um, 
so that that he wouldn't get to her. Well, he punched to the to the to the car window, and. Um, the, the thing that was so insane was that when we asked her, you know, you want to press charges, you know, she said no, and then uh, because he would never hurt her. So I thought, well, how much do you need to know of what you can do if he's doing that? So again, you know, in, in these injuries, if there's so much, so much gapping between, I'm sorry, if there's so much gapping between the 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 wound and the uh, arterial laceration and it's a complete laceration you have to bypass them um, because the injury it's a ragged artery uh, you can't put it back together you can't patch it um, part of it maybe even from both um, I don't remember how old this injury was um, and then you have to bypass it so what we did is we took some saphenous vein from his leg and turn it around because you have to reverse it to get arterial flow out of it and uh, sewed it to the brachial artery above the here and then you see it a little bit better on the next one um, it goes gets connected below the antecubital fossa into the uh, brachial artery here uh, these are what you call them vessel loops. They go around the arteries. We can snug them up and, and occlude the vessel that we bypass to temporarily so we can sew to it. Um, but the proximal anastomosis is already in and the distal is then sewn in and that's the way it looked. We couldn't spare his tattoo. We really tried very hard to do that so that we at least you know, would get the wound as a mouth of this face that he had there, but we weren't too successful. Did he sue you for money? Uh, n he may have tried, I don't know, we never heard of it again. But sometimes they get pretty nasty about that. Um, and he did fine, he had no neurologic deficits. The, the other thing that happens with these injuries, you know, they get, the, they get the nerves, and when you have a nerve injury, it's much harder to fix. The plastic surgeon has to come in to do it, and the residual deficits are, are a, lot, a lot of times more neurologically than vascular. <coughs> now this was uh, somebody who had a, a, a this, nice gentleman who was was trying to take care of some trees and got his chainsaw into the um, medial aspect of his right calf, of his uh, left calf and uh, totally tore the posterior tibial artery apart and we get these calls you know um, you know somebody tries to commit very dramatic suicide by lacerating the radial artery and and really doesn't work that well because you don't really put the pressure on the radial artery and usually just stops bleeding so it doesn't work so well to come with, commit suicide with it. Um, posterior tibial artery is pretty much the same. It's a small vessel. You have three arteries going into the foot so um, you can sacrifice one of them in healthy young individuals. You know if these are diabetic people 70, 80 years old they already may have one or two occluded and they live on one artery into the foot. That's a different story but he was like in his 20s or 30s and he had a good dorsalis pedis pulse, which is the continuation of the anterior tibial artery, so that um, this, uh, the trauma surgeon just ligated this and, and uh, then closed it up here with a little drain in there, and he went home and lived happily ever after. So blunt trauma is a different story. Blunt trauma, um, do you guys want me to take a break or are you okay? All right. Um, blunt trauma is, is a little bit more insidious because you never really see what's getting injured too well and you can make, um, you can miss a lot of stuff and that can be fatal. So seatbelt injuries, for example, are the thing where when people get thrown against the, the bottom part of the seatbelt, uh, it can actually cause a dissection of the abdominal aorta. Uh, because the, the, the impact is so hard that, that um, you know, you separate the layers, the three layers in the, in the artery of the intima, the media, and the adventitia. And they can get separated just by an acute um, impact. 
And when that happens, they may not be symptomatic right away, but um, you know, over time, either an incidental CAT scan can show um, you know a, a saccular aneurysm, which is an acute, which is an outpocketing of the blood vessel that happens from the weakening of the wall, um, or they can actually go on very quickly to um, a ruptured aorta or or an occluded aorta. Falls is another one. You know, falls is a sudden impact, um, um, high impact, high speed impact that you know comes suddenly to a halt, and you have the the um, you, you have the tear of the of, of the blood vessel at that time that can cause um, a death very quickly, or um, if not recognized in the hospital and emergency room. Um, what we see, uh, we, we see a lot of car accidents at Lehigh Valley in Allentown because 78 runs right by it and people do things on their motorcycles there that they shouldn't. And there's a lot of people who come in with motorcycle injuries. Um, we also, in, at Pocono, where I, where, I also, oops, where I spend a considerable amount of time, um, we have a lot of people who um, live alone and they're not being appropriately cared for by their families and they suddenly have an event at home um, where they become immobile. And when they become immobile, then there's nobody around that can help them. And some of these people can get to the phone. Uh, there is a story about an elderly gentleman whose wife uh, was de is demented or was demented, and he fell in the basement going down to the basement. He fell in the basement. He was lying for three days on a concrete floor, and his wife, who was demented, brought him potato chips and iced tea because he didn't want to go to the hospital. So he was lying there until the daughter called, who was suspicious why mom hadn't called and dad hadn't called, and then came in after three days to find him on the on the on the floor in the basement, and she called the the, the EMTs. Now, what is the problem there? The problem is that people can't move, and when people can't move, they get a pressure injury, and pressure injuries can be very very serious. Uh, it's not only the the sacral decubitus in the nursing home patient. It's not only the, um, the superficial muscle or skin injury that comes from, from um, you know, an acute pressure injury. No, these people actually go on to have ischemic muscle that can cause rhabdomyolysis, renal failure, respiratory failure, and, um, and death. And they lose their leg. This guy, this elderly gentleman lost his leg because his, um, uh, he had so much edema from the, from the, um, Raptor that he lost his circulation to the leg. Um, CT scan is the best diagnostic test for that. Also, compartment pressures in the calf. Uh, not everybody does that. Uh, orthopedic surgery does that. Emergency room physicians usually know how to take compartment pressures. And if the compartment pressure in the muscle compartments is high, then that usually means you have compartment syndrome and they have to have a fasciotomy, meaning opening up the compartment so that the muscle can expand. Therefore, the, the nerves and the arteries can circulate again or, or can can live for that matter um, this is a blunt injury a forklift injury so how much does a forklift weigh I don't know it's heavy right so you get that over your foot um, it's not a hell of a lot left you know um, this is debatable whether this is salvageable um, we didn't really have much to do with that because there wasn't much to do vascular-wise. This is end vessel disease, you know, meaning I can't bypass into anything. You can't bypass into the digits here. Um, so that's kind of a plastic surgery, orthopedic surgery case. Uh, leg versus train. So this is even more a problem. You know, so if something rolls over over your your distal leg, uh, this is tibia, this is fibula, it's all apart. Uh, you can't even tell what's still there and what's still functioning. You know, um, in the trauma center, you have three surgeons making the decision for an acute amputation, and that's the trauma surgeon and uh, a lot of times a plastic surgeon, you know, to see whether this is salvageable. 
and uh, this wasn't salvageable. Um, this is uh, another nice case where a 30-some-year-old gentleman uh, was doing heroin in the bathtub with his girlfriend and um, uh, they both fell asleep um, in the bathtub. Uh, she didn't wake up, he woke up. Um, she died um, lying on top of him and he was lying on, on the floor in the bathtub all night long without moving. So he came to the emergency room um, because he couldn't move his right leg. And this is when I talk about compartment syndrome. And they called the vascular surgeon because they say, well, he couldn't move his right leg, so that's got to be vascular injury. And, um, but no, he had pulses, and, uh, but he couldn't, move his, he couldn't move his foot. And he had uh, no sensation. And so as it goes, you know, whoever sees him first kind of buys it and so I was there first and I, I kind of tried to figure this out and this is kind of very unusual. I, honestly, I've, I've never seen this before. Um, uh, he had compartments in one of the buttocks and he had compressed his, his uh, femoral nerve, he had compressed his, his um, uh, he didn't compress his arteries but uh, it was a nerve injury from the, from the um, compartment syndrome. So the thing that gave it away was that he also was complaining about buttock pain and the CAT scan showed a lot of buttock edema. So we did what is rarely ever done is a buttock fasciotomy. And um, this is all the necrotic muscle that we had to debride. And he went back then on the trauma service multiple times to debride it and uh, then we finally wound racked it, which is, um, you know, the special dressing we use on open wounds. Um, you may even have patients, when you, when you come and see somebody in the apartment, they may have, or in the house, they may have uh, a wound back on their, on their uh, incisions. Um, and he lived, he moved to Florida happily ever after and uh, said he would change his life. So that was a hard lesson learned. In terms of the ischemic legs, so we know that uh, they can't move their toes, they can't move their leg. You have to kind of uh, figure out, is this compartment syndrome, is this acute ischemic event, is this uh, a worsening uh, chronic event, how long has it been? After four hours, um, muscle ischemia will cause rhabdomyolysis with renal failure and shock, can lead to respiratory failure and death. Uh, was it an acute event? Was it a sudden onset of pain? Are they saying, well, doc, um, you know, uh, everything was fine until just two hours ago and suddenly my leg went cold and numb and I couldn't move it anymore and that's why I called you. So if it's an acute event, it's probably some kind of a cardioembolic event. Uh, as I said before, uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, chronic atrial fibrillation. Maybe they didn't take their Coumadin for two days. Maybe they forgot to take it. Um, so that their, their INR, their, their measurement of how high their, their Coumadin level is, is, is not accurate. And uh, so there are multiplicity of, of reasons why they could uh, have a clot. Um, but can the patient still move the toes? If they can move their toes, you have some time. So um, load them up and bring them to the emergency room. Chronic event, slowly progressing ischemia with rest pain. Uh, they will complain about, uh, I've had pain in my foot for, uh, you know, weeks and every time I go to sleep the pain is so bad and I have to put my foot down and walk around a little bit uh, just to make it feel better. And the reason why that is, is because the flow is so compromised that only gravity can bring them enough flow into the foot to get pain relief. Uh, they don't have claudication, they don't even walk fast enough to claudicate. They simply don't have enough blood flow when their leg is level that enough blood flow goes into the foot. So that's why the key question for them is, does it feel better when you put your foot down? They say, yeah, doc, that's why I have to sit at night inside of the bed or I sleep in a chair, you know. Um, and this is what rest pain is. That is the level where is, is kind of right before they start having tissue loss or start being uh, at risk of losing a leg, losing a toe, losing whatever. And that's what I said, made better with putting foot into the dependent position. 
chronic wounds already. Maybe they already have chronic wounds and they just have neglected it. So this one you can just bag and take your time with, okay? This isn't going anywhere and I can't fix that. This is fixable. Well, part of it is fixable. Somebody already tried to do something there, take a toe off and as you see it didn't heal. It's kind of darkish, bluish, there's some nylon sutures there, looks kind of crummy. But this actually is still a little pink. You know, it comes from, you know, not really wearing good shoes and having abused your foot and not having enough circulation. So then you get the, the skin erosion underneath this muscle tissue. This is some yellow slough. Skin already is ischemic here. Uh, likely the whole forefoot has to come off and then you also see a heel ulcer. So this, this is pretty gnarly. This is not going to go too well. So in terms of limb salvage, um, with an acute event, uh, you can try to scoot, uh, scoop an embolus out of an artery by using a catheter if you know where it is. And a lot of times we do arteriograms and we'll get to that too. The arteriogram will show me that there is an occlusion of an artery and uh, it usually can say whether it's a chronic occlusion or an acute occlusion. Um, clots in an artery look very characteristic of having some kind of meniscus um, so that you can tell what is a clot and what is, what is um, chronic disease. And if it's an acute event, and most of these events um, usually are in the femoral popliteal artery, um, you, you can make a small incision in the groin and uh, put a catheter down and, and then scoot the whole scoop the whole clot out and then fix the artery, put them on heparin and be done with. Um, endovascular repair, if it's a plaque that ruptured inside the artery and occluded the whole artery, um, you can open up the, the, the occlusion and put a, stent, uh, put a balloon and a stent in. And then the good old um, uh, you know, standard way of fixing it is uh, bypass surgery with a vein graft or sometimes also use um, what we use a cryo a vein graft from the patient or use a cryopreserved vein from, uh, from somebody else. They usually don't work very well at all or use some uh, PTFE, Gore-Tex plastic kind of stuff. Uh, you can also simply repair the artery, open up the artery, uh, take the obstruction out and put a patch on top of it and repair it, or simply tie it off if, if that's a legitimate thing to do at that time. So this was, um, this was Mr. G. Mr. G is a um, gentleman who's been torturing us for probably two years now. He's 49 years old, he weighs 350 pounds, he's a diabetic, he's a smoker, uh, he is totally non-compliant and he's very manipulative in trying to explain to you that he has to go to a rehab facility that allows him to go outside to smoke. Um, uh, so that's the whole setup here. So about in 2017 he came in with a um, uh, dead toe on the right foot and uh, he underwent toe amputation that didn't heal. Um, he was still walking around with it, putting pressure on it, it got worse. He then had a bypass um, by my partner and he had such severe problems with wound healing on his thigh from, the, from where we took the saphenous vein out uh, that it took him four months to heal that. And then he disappeared a little bit from the radar screen because then he had developed a heel also on the right foot and he was sent somewhere else to a special podiatrist to fix his heel and he got a wound back on and then uh, he showed up in the emergency room in March of this year um, with uh, sepsis, acute renal failure and a partially dead foot on the left. Now this is the left, okay? So he was very sick. He went on broad spectrum antibiotics and then I did a um, what's called a femoral to posterior tibial bypass with his own vein and this is called in situ where we uh, use, use the saphenous vein but we leave it where it is. We'll just reverse the flow. We hook it into the artery up here. We put an instrument here that allows us to take all the valves out of the vein and then the flow goes this way into the posterior tibial artery. So when you look at this, when I saw that, I, I, and I had to 
get all the contamination out of here and clean that up a little bit. Um, you know, I started thinking, what the hell am I going to do with this? You know, this isn't going anywhere. So we put a lot of work into this, and this is looks after we cleaned it up. And then this is now after uh, wound vac and uh, in the wound care center where we see him. And and um, so was it March, April, May? So this is you know two or three months now. Um, the question is still, what am I going to do with it? You can't leave him with one toe. You know, that's kind of, uh, it's, it's more problems than, than benefit to him. But he has his leg and he has his foot. And I will tell you, 350 pounds taking somebody's leg off and teaching that person to, to walk again, and also with a non-compliant patient, you better try to do everything to save his leg. Um, so that seems to be working out pretty well. The reason why I'm showing this is the difference between when you restore blood flow, what difference that, that makes, you know. This is what it looked like before, and this is once you get some blood flow in there and then debris it again, you have to take some more bone out, you have to clean it up more, and then you put a wound back on it, and it will heal, it will come together. You know, can you skin graft it? Probably. Is it going to be working on him? Um, Probably not, because uh, he's not going to listen to you and stay off it, and he's going to keep smoking. And any plastic surgeon will tell you that they won't quit smoking. You know, they're orthopedic surgeons that don't operate on you because you're smoking. I can't say that. I can't say I can't operate on you because you're smoking. So, and then we have venous ulcers. Um, and venous ulcers is the one of the mill um, events that uh, you see when um, uh, people have a long history of, of either working on, on hard floors that could be working in a service industry, uh, physician, nurses, EMT, firefighters, policemen, teachers, bartenders, waitresses, waiters, uh, nurses. Um, because what happens is with all the lifting you're doing, or the carrying you're doing, or the standing you're doing, the valves inside your veins start to buckle. And the way we um, explain venous circulation is, is we use the calf pump. The calf pump is that every time you walk, every time you contract your calf, venous flow is initiated because veins don't have muscular walls. So it relies on your skeletal muscles to push the blood through your veins towards your heart. And the valves inside the veins, once your muscle relaxes, keeps the blood from running backwards. Well, with the Valsalva maneuver of lifting heavy, standing, uh, these valves finally get damaged because there's so much back pressure that these valves will buckle and give out. And then people develop varicose veins, or they develop swelling in their legs from the inability to remove the blood from the calves or from, from the lower legs. And um, then this is called venous reflux disease and they can develop um, ulcers because the pressure gets so high that the skin actually becomes reactive in becoming thicker and thicker and actually irritated, becomes red and, and dry and hard and then in the end the, the skin cracks and becomes an ulcer. And these are venous stasis ulcers. They're very hard to very hard to, not, not hard to fix clinically, it doesn't take a rocket science to, 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 to fix it, it just takes a lot of patience and cooperation by the patient to fix it, because they have to get it wrapped every week, they have to keep their legs up, and um, that's the only way you can do it. Uh, people develop then also thrombosed varicosities, um, which is the slow blood flow in those varicose veins can cause stasis and then the, 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 the varicosities just clot off. They're very, very painful, but usually it's not very dangerous because it's superficial, it's not deep. The dangerous condition is deep vein thrombosis, and as you all know, this can cause pulmonary embolus. Um, pulmonary embolus can be deadly. Um, uh, certainly people complain about um, shortness of breath or chest pain. You have to be um, uh, very cognizant and suspicious of them having something like that, especially if they've been sedentary um, or they had recent pregnancies or they had recent leg injuries, uh, you know, any kind of hip surgeries, knee surgeries. Uh, it's more common to develop a DVT after any kind of orthopedic procedure or for 
that matter surgical procedures where there's general, general anesthesia involved. Um, also, uh, certainly contrib contributing to this is volume overload, diabetes, obesity, sedentary lifestyle. We call them chair sleepers. Beds they sleep in their recliner with their legs down all the time, and you can't get them to lie in bed and put their legs up. They can't do it because maybe they have back problems, they have mobility issues, they have severe arthritis. So a lot of things that go into this. And then naturally the varicose veins, and we talked about that. So this is a venous stasis also. This is actually one of our milk carton patients. Um, he should be on the, on, the, on the box of something because he was an amazing save. It's a guy who had a um, very, very nice gentleman, um, uh, very, very, very uh, involved person with his care. But he had been seen at another hospital for um, venous stasis ulcers. And, you know, my phone, my, my, my hospital phone got wiped, so I'd lost a lot of the pictures. But he had almost a totally destroyed lower leg with large venous stasis ulcers. And you can see the residuals here, residuals here, and then also in the, in the upper calf. And because of the healing, and we finally got it all healed. After two years, we got it all healed. And what happened is that because of the healing, the, the skin now in this area is so tight that there's very little space for the elasticity of the skin to give and accommodate any kind of volume changes. And, you know, he's a large gentleman, and uh, in the summer he drinks a little bit more, and then the legs swell up, and then he gets these ulcer, this ulcer back. In fact, I had seen him today, and he just healed this one again. So we explained to him, you got to have yourself an Una boot, which is a compression wrap, and um, his wife puts that on for him. You got to always wear a compression garment to prevent this from happening, because this is always going to be a critical um, part of your lower leg that will be the problem, and it will return unless you absolutely baby it and take care of it forever. Um, so Una boot, which is a paste boot. Dr. Una was the guy who invented this. Uh, it's been around for a, a thousand years and still works. Um, sometimes it's coated with um, zinc oxide and sometimes it has um, um, calamine in it too so they don't get itchy. Uh, leg elevation and there's a torrential compression pump you can use and uh, Medicare makes you jump through hoops to get that for a patient because it costs about a thousand bucks to, to order. Um, compression stockings, much hated by people because they're hard to put on, hard to get off, and older people with arthritic hands and, and decreased strength can't put them on. Uh, lifestyle changes can be a good idea, and weight loss. Um, uh, but the key is really the compression garments, and there's a variety available um, to, you know, match some people's needs. So uh, this was, I forgot who that was. So we, we actually go as far as putting grafts on. These are skin substitute. This was something called Primatrix, which kind of fallen out of favor. And we'll pack it down with proline sutures around these large ulcers. The, the opposite leg has one too. And um, they, they uh, you know, produce collagen and actually start having to help new skin in growth. Um, and that's a repeated treatment in the operating room. So there's a lot of work involved in these people who, who have these large ulcers. Sean, break, keep going. Um, okay. Uh, well, I have uh, cerebral stuff, and then I have triple A stuff and mesenteric stuff, and then then I have um, just a wrap up. Hi 
Sorry, we got stuck on a call. So oh, that's okay. No, no, <laughs> no. You do important things. You know, no problem. Sure. Good. Alrighty. Um, so cerebral ischemic event. We're going to keep moving to. Um, uh, some of the details of what I touched on before on, on stroke transient ischemic attack and then also mesenteric ischemia. Um, and I'll show you some CAT scan. I'll show you some CAT scan of abdominal aneurysms and an arteriogram of mesenteric um, audio occlusion. Um, and uh, I, I didn't mention on the previous, uh, the, the last half of the talk, uh, in, in terms of control of hemorrhage, and, and Sean and I just talked about that a little bit, um, and I think uh, you, you guys have a program where you teach uh, the, the, the lay population um, to stop bleeding in an acute situation, and I think that's an, that's an awesome idea and a, and a wonderful thing to do because that is critical in, in knowing how to do that and also feeling, you know, nobody's feel comfortable unless you know you're, you're used to it but at least you, you learn how to react in an emergency situation and that's important because you don't always stop the bleeding by putting your finger into the hole you, you, you the, the stopping the bleeding may be putting pressure on something that's more proximal and that may be more effective in any event I don't want to go there right now but so a cerebral ischemic event uh, as we said before could be a transient event um, you know for two minutes somebody says well doc I just lost my in the left eye and then it came back and now I'm fine and uh, you know my my daughter told me that I should go and see you because you know that could be a stroke and uh, yeah she's right uh, temporary stroke then you have the CVA which is a completed stroke. Um, most larger hospitals now have a stroke alert. Um, so when you have somebody on, on the ambulance that, that has signs of a stroke, you can call a stroke alert and the, you may ask for consultation and then they come in and the, the hospital calls a stroke alert. If you're within a four hour window, uh, Stroke centers can initiate TPA, which is a thrombo, um, thrombolytic, to uh, inject that at the time of the of the emergency room visit and uh, initiate an immediate neurologic cons neurology consult, and then um, uh, the the thrombolysis, and then people can be out of the window, meaning the four hour window where you can do this, and then they usually get admitted and um, you get a whole workup of of um, you know where this came from and what to do about it. So the issue is always embolic versus ischemic. Uh, ischemic comes from usually some type of blockage in an artery that could be intracerebral or could be uh, extracranial in the cervical portion of the carotid or the vertebral arteries, uh, or embolic. And embolic means that a clot was generated elsewhere in the body and then it came loose and went somewhere. And it can go anywhere. It can go to the head, it can go to the arm, it can go to the legs, it can go to the kidneys, it can go to the intestine. So that's an embolic event and they can be very dangerous. When you pull these clots out, they're, they're really interesting. Some of them are very large and you figure this thing has been sitting around in somebody's left ventricle for you don't know how long and then suddenly it cracks loose and goes somewhere. And it's the luck of the draw where it goes. Um, the other thing you always have to rule out is the cerebral hemorrhage. You know, do they have mental status changes? They complain about headaches. Maybe their blood pressure was uh, 300 or 160 when you when uh, you know when they had dinner and and uh, then suddenly got a bad headache and started having mental status changes. When you come in, when they call you and you come in, you know these kind of are important things to know because intracerebral hemorrhage can be a fatal event very quickly. You know, they can. Um, the, the, the skull is a closed is a closed space. You know, it can't expand. So when you bleed into the skull, into the brain, the brain can't go anywhere. It gets compressed, and then you have um, a brainstem injury, and uh, that's usually the end of it. Um, 
when you see these people on the initial evaluation, have they had signs of a stroke and maybe the family can tell you are these old residual um, uh, effects from the stroke, you know, some uh, left arm, right arm weakness, weakness in their legs, uh, speech disturbance, um, facial droop, any of those things that could have been an old stroke and that is really something that is nothing that has to do with the current situation you're seeing them for. Um, can they communicate? Can they give you a history? Um, neurology is, is a stat consult for these people when they get into the emergency room. And um, then the question to initiate possible thrombolysis or antiplatelet therapy. You know, with a cardiac event, you give them an aspirin. Same thing with a stroke. You know, a lot of times you can give them a, you can give them a, 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 an aspirin. Um, uh, could that be a problem if you, if they have an intracerebral bleed? Yes, but uh, probably not so um, as to possibly helping them uh, to treat an embolic event. So carotid stenosis is something vascular surgeons uh, see all the time. This is a bread and butter stuff that we do. It's probably one of the most scrutinized um, anatomic blockages uh, that there is that has been studied in multiple um, large study groups of thousands of patients to decide should they have surgery, when they should, when they should have surgery, or whether they shouldn't have surgery when medical th therapy is the correct treatment or when surgical treatment is the correct therapy. And now in the mix we also now have stenting, so there's carotid stenting that um, is interesting because it alleviates a surgical incision, general anesthesia, and all those kind of things. So it's, it's, a, it's a, probably one of the most scrutinized uh, pathology uh, and, and uh, talked about uh, surgical uh, indications. So there's always symptomatic versus asymptomatic, and asymptomatic um, is, is uh, there have been no signs, and the reason why you pick it up is because uh, the family doctor, you, um, or, or the vascular surgeon, he is what we call a carotid bruit, and that is a swishing sound on the side of the neck over the carotid artery. Um, sometimes it's very subtle, sometimes it's very loud. Uh, you always have to listen to the heart at the same time because the cardiac murmur can be referred to the neck and you think you have a carotid buoy, but actually it's a cardiac murmur. But you can't dismiss it because they can have a cardiac murmur and a carotid buoy. So at least uh, you owe them to do a carotid ultrasound, which is a very easy study to do and, and, and technologically a very advanced study now um, that gives you a good answer. Um, so then you, f you find out um, how, how much of this blockage they have, how much of a stenosis they have. Is it a, and we, we divide them up into mild, moderate, and severe according to the velocity of blood flow. Um, a large river that carries a lot of water flows very slowly. If you force all that water into a smaller area, the water starts going much quicker. And that's the same with blood flow. If you run the same amount of blood flow through a smaller area, the speed goes up. So we have a chart that um, attaches the velocities of the blood flow with statistically the, the uh, stenosis, the narrowing of the artery that goes along with that speed. So there's 20 to 69 percent blockage, then 70 to 79 percent blockage, then 80 to 99 percent blockage. 80 to 99 percent blockage has a velocity of 300 centimeters per second systolic over 100 centimeters per second diastolic. Normal velocity in a carotid artery is around 90 to 100 centimeters per second. Um, so that in and of itself can tell you whether somebody has a severe stenosis or not. We only operate on patients that have an 80% blockage if they're asymptomatic. The rules are that if they're symptomatic, they come in with a TIA, and they have a 50 to 69% blockage, that is an indication to operate on these people because they're at risk of developing a stroke. Um, so they're very high, they're very distinct criteria of making the surgical decisions. 
people who are not eligible for dental anesthesia, who have very high risk for cardiopulmonary complications, uh, they have uh, cardiomyopathy, they have an ejection fraction of, what, 5% or so, they can't even breathe without going into congestive heart failure, they should not have carotid endarterectomy. They should get a stent. And those are really study groups and protocols that are set up to divide people into the different um, classes of uh, what kind of treatment they, they would be benefiting from. So the carotid ultrasound is a standard initial workup. It then gets followed by a CTA, which is a CT scan of the arteries. It, it focuses on the arterial anatomy and it shows, and you'll see them here, um, you know, it shows you the plaque, it shows you the stenosis, they had computer models where you can get different, um, different views, whether you want to get sagittal views, where you cut the patient like this, or like this, or like this. And you can compare all those views and then get a 3D uh, computer image of that and that shows you very clearly how severe the stenosis is. Neurology evaluation in somebody who has a neurologic event is also valuable, and then certainly um, us uh, to decide, uh, help to decide what to do. So this is uh, this is a CTA, and you can see that the this is a common carotid artery. This is the jaw. Um, and common carotid arteries coming up from the arch, here's the sternum. Um, this is a little bit of calcium plaque in the common carotid artery. Then the common carotid artery branches into the internal carotid artery going to the brain and the external carotid artery that goes to the face. So here you see uh, on, on, on this view pretty severe stenosis and that is also brought out by the other view where you have also a narrowing right here and, and plaque sitting right in front of it. Now, if you took this in cross sections, you would see that there actually is still an opening in here. And I think I have a picture, the next picture is actually the plaque that we take out. And you see, this is where we cut through to open up the artery, and then we take the plaque out. This is the portion of the external carotid artery, and this is the common here, and this is the internal up here. And then I think I may have one where I actually show you the, no. So this is the this is the intima and the media, and we leave the adventitia. So the three layers of the artery, we take the innermost out. This is where the plaque sits, and then we leave the adventitia. And what the body does. Uh, so if you compare this to, um, you drive on a road and they fix the road and they cut the macadam, you know, down to the gravel, and there's this big bump. You drive down, and you have another bump when you drive back up. Well, that's the carotid and autorectomy site, and then you start filling it in because the body, right after the surgery, starts laying down fibroblasts and it and it smooths this out. So, on occasions when we have to go back and we have to do a redo, um, we see that the wall actually has been completely restored. The only problem at that point is that the body doesn't know when to stop laying down the fibroblasts, so it keeps building it up. And this is why for the past um, 15 years or so, we always put a patch on top of the opening of the artery so we make that repair site bigger so it doesn't close up again. So we don't see that many redos anymore. All right, uh, I never asked you, I'm sorry, I didn't ask you whether any questions for any of the things that I'm talking about. I mean, you can wait until the end or you can also interrupt me. Um, so abdominal aortic aneurysms, um, one of the things that is, uh, f for a surgeon, for vascular surgeon, it's one of the things that uh, is probably the only thing that gets to your heart a little bit racing at 2 o'clock in the morning because time is really of an essence and 90% um, of the time it's just a big mess. Um, and and it, it really asks you to to think very quickly on your feet and and you, you don't have much uh, margin of error here in, in making the right decisions. Um, 
So 98% of the 95-98% uh, of the ruptured aneurysms, abdominalic aneurysms, are below the renal arteries. The remainder is juxtarenal, that means right next to the renal arteries, or suprarenal, and um, uh, that's a much, much different uh, challenge in repair. So fortunately, uh, over 90% of them rupture infrarenally, so that uh, if it has to get fixed, clamp below the renal arteries and save the renal function and don't have to waste, not waste, but uh, don't have to spend time on re-implanting renal arteries into the graft. Now how do these people present? Um, it's a variety. They can have back pain, they can have abdominal pain, they can just feel nauseous and throw up and uh, they may not know they have an aneurysm and that's usually the, the, the uh, skeevy thing about it that they just have no clue what's hitting them and um, there's a high degree of suspicion. You know, they can have syncope. Uh, we had an 86-year-old guy who fell out of bed and passed out and he had a previous aneurysm repair but he actually started leaking from that aneurysm repair and um, passed out, fell out of bed, was brought in, uh, was bradycardic um, and hypotensive. Uh, EMT called the ER. Um, they actually put him in as a cardiac event and um, worked him up for three hours for uh, syncope and bradycardia and had him already admitted on the medical service <coughs> to the ICU with bradycardia until they realized he had also abdominal pain, got a CAT scan and saw that he had erupted aneurysm. So they called me up and I was already three hours behind the eight ball here and um, he was then intubated and he, uh, we took him to the OR and uh, um, next day. So um, it's a very difficult diagnosis to make sometimes, but um, it should always be in the back of your mind, back pain, abdominal pain, um, even, you know, syncopal episode is a little bit far-fetched, but, you know, it's part of it too. I have a question. I remember having a AAA one time at St. Joe's here in Baltimore, and the guy was modeled. Mm -hmm. Is that a common early occurrence, or no? That's already late? yeah. Okay. I mean, we do save him, but he, I remember the modeling. Yeah. Because they go into shock, and then all the peripheral perfusion goes down the drain, and uh, they turn blue and get modeled in their legs and their arms. A little bit far down the road already. You don't want them there. There are criteria where you actually can predict whether these people will live or not, or have a good chance to live or not a good chance to live. One of them is cardiac arrest, um, um, you know, prolonged shock, respiratory failure, intubated, um, acidosis, um, and hypotension. When you have that, uh, you're fighting an uphill battle. We would get them flown in, and um, I remember. Uh, somebody coming off the helicopter and, and they were doing CPR and we had them in the operating room and there wasn't even anything possible. Uh, so 70% mortality now in our days of putting stents in. Um, a big thing is to do endovascular approach first in patients who can, can have it. Uh, it requires that you have a parts department in your operating room, which means that you have all the different sizes and stent on the, on the shelf because everybody comes in different sizes and different lengths and, and it requires different, uh, different parts and it's very expensive to keep that inventory so only large trauma centers have that inventory otherwise uh, you go to the good old open repair uh, open the belly put the clamps on and sew it so this is um, Another CTA, and this is an infrarenal abdominalic aneurysm. Um, so you see uh, heart, chest, lungs. You see the ascending aorta, some calcium in the vessel. Then, um, since you know this is uh, comes in different sections, we're missing the section here where the where the infrarenal uh, where the uh, descending aorta comes down and then goes through the diaphragm into the into the abdomen. So you see the splenic artery here. You see a little bit of the hepatic artery, and this is the neck with the orifice of the um, right renal artery and the left renal artery. You, you can't see here. You see the calcifications. This is actually the outline of the aneurysm. So this is all clot. 
This is the blood flow inside the aneurysm. And then you see the calcium in the iliac arteries. You also see the calcium in the, in the femoral and ex, um, external iliac arteries. And the cross-section looks like this. You know, this is the aneurysm right here. And this is the lumen where the blood flow goes through. So when you repair this endovascularly, you make an incision in the groins, and then you pass wires up. Over the wires go essentially two parts, and I have a picture of one of the um, uh, stent grafts. The main portion goes up here and gets fixed up here, and then from the other side you put the other part in here that ends in the iliac arteries, and you exclude blood flow from the aneurysm. That's the treatment of the aneurysm. You prevent the rupture of the aneurysm by diverting blood flow through um, this, this pre-made tube. So this is a stent graft. Uh, it comes with little hooks. It gets crimped like, a par like, a, like an umbrella. You know, you, you put it together like this, and it goes in the catheter, and then you insert it into the artery, and you advance it, and uh, then you release it. Um, this goes below the renal arteries. This part gets hooked above the renal arteries. Um, and, and you balloon it open so that it pushes into the wall and makes these little hooks stick in there and it doesn't come loose. And you see this is called the main body. This piece is a longer piece that ends over here and that usually goes into the iliac artery and then the contralateral approach we put the second piece in and, and uh, it overlaps with this piece and um, excludes the, the aneurysm. So we talked a little bit about um, acute and chronic mesenteric ischemia. Um, we talked about uh, fear of food, chronic weight loss. Um, so I'm talking about this here too. Um, abdominal pain approximately 30 minutes post meal, no large meals. They usually eat little snacks six times a day. Uh, they can't really eat pasta. They can't eat um, heavy meals that involve a lot of fat. Um, and they have a 30 pound weight loss, uh, even more sometimes. Uh, most commonly it involves at least two out of three mesenteric arteries. So it hangs on one artery uh, that they still have a, a functioning bowel. An acute uh, ischemia is sudden occlusion of one of the or two of the mesenteric arteries by embolic event. Survival of acute event depends on fast transfer to hospital and intervention such as SMA embolectomy versus bypass versus stent placement. Treatment of chronic ischemia involves stenting of vessel or bypass. So. Uh, the, the chronic ischemia is not an emergency. You know, they usually go to a doctor, wait in the waiting room, and you know, say, Doc, or they get sent by the family doctor, and they say, Doc, you know, I, I can't really eat that much. I've lost weight, and and then you work them up for chronic ischemia. Uh, the the acute ischemia is what's so dangerous because these people have no signs of this that that would predict that this is going to happen. It it just happens. They get diffuse abdominal pain, um, they get nauseous, they may throw up, and um, uh, there could be a gastritis. Sometimes it's being treated as a gastritis, sometimes it's being treated as a diverticulitis, um, until uh, there has to be always a very high degree of suspicion, especially if they're on atrial fibrillation, they have problems with anticoagulation, their INR isn't, isn't elevated, uh, so that these events can happen and this more like to happen. So this was actually, oh, she was a um, very nice lady, 59 years, she's young, a heavy duty smoker. Uh, she also has uh, symptomatic carotid disease. She has left subclavian artery stenosis. She can't really lift her left much with her left arm because of claudication in the left arm. Um, uh, a, a SMA stenosis. And when we say that um, we need two blood vessels out of three, uh, she did not meet that criteria. Uh, she was going to go down to have a carotid fixed by me. And uh, because she also had uh, amaurosis fugax and she had some um, left hemiparesis, so we were going to fix her right carotid, which is severe. 
and um, when she was in the holding area she started complaining about severe abdominal pain and we knew that she had uh, SMA disease and uh, it, it was so out of whack that I said I'm canceling the carotid uh, you go in for an arteriogram and um, the arteriogram shows actually and mesenteric arteriograms are always crappy because they have to look through the laterally through the belly and um, see this and you can see that the celiac artery is right here and there's some gallbladder clips here and then the SMA stump is right here and that's all she wrote so you can't see it on the, the one thing you see here is that there is no there's no bowel there's no mesenteric arteries here there's no mesentery you just see straight shot uh, beautiful aorta iliac arteries um, you know, I think this is the IMA. Uh, this is uh, these are, this is the left renal, right renal. Up here you have the celiac, but there's no SMA coming out. Usually you see the stranding of the mesenteric arteries all the way around here. You don't see that. So that was a big problem. Blood flow to the bowel on that side. There's, she had acute loss of blood flow. Yes, to the bowel. So. She ended up going to the operating room, and uh, in the operating room, then we, uh, we we ran her bowel, and the bowel looked. Um, uh, the bowel looked dusky. Um, there was also uh, a palpable mass in the ileocecal valve and um, we called the general surgeon and asked him whether this was a tumor so we thought maybe she had abdominal pain also from the tumor but this was actually watershed area where she had uh, the ischemic event so this this ischemic bowel was removed and then we did a bypass from the aorta right here and we used um, bovine carotid artery from a cow, bovine carotid artery from a cow uh, because it was, a, it was not a clean environment anymore and this is the other part of the, the bypass. This bypass goes from the aorta behind the um, renal vein, renal artery, all the way up here then it comes around and goes onto the mesentery and that's where we, sh we sewed it in. And when you see, look at this, these are the mesenteric arteries and that's what you should see on an arteriogram. Now this is after the bypass was sewn in um, and it shows really nice perfusion and she did well. She still needs her carotid fixed. <laughs> and that's it. Okay. Any questions? Did I make my time? Yes, sir. Gentleman's laying in bed, and the entire bed is full of blood. And all he said was, was that we looked at his leg, and basically he had varicose veins on both sides. Mm -hmm. He had varicose veins in the blood. Yeah. And once you got it cleaned off, you could see that the hole was only that big, but the entire bed was full of blood because of this. I don't know how much pressure was in there, but the varicose veins said, "I'll be fine. I just need to go get this clean." Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and that's a that's a great point. That's a great point, and and that is a, it's it's one of the scariest thing for these people because it it really it's like Friday the thirteenth. It really goes all over the place. They're in the bathroom, um, you know, ladies may sh shave their legs and they hit one of those those veins, and this stuff just explodes, and it scares the hell out of them. This, the treatment is simple. All you have to do is lie down, put your leg up, and have some of your whole pressure on it, it goes away. Because by gravity, venous blood drains towards the heart, so the congestion that you have in your legs when you stand or when your leg is down is not there anymore, and that's how you stop it. But it's a mess. You know, the, the bed gets all bloody, you know, it looks like somebody got stabbed or, or, or shot, and, and it's really nothing. It's on, you know, I shouldn't say nothing, but it's not nothing serious. We had a patient one time here, um, a patient first at Urgent Care Center, mm -hmm. and we got the call at a hemorrhage tourniquet applied. Well, when we walked in the patient first, you didn't have to ask who the patient was. There was a trail of blood. It looked like someone had slaughtered a cow in the room. Mm -hmm. And there's no way you can tell if you're looking at an artery or a vein or what. There's just blood everywhere. And the 
guy said he had hit his leg on the car door, the edge of the car door. Mm -hmm. Well, we immediately put a tourniquet on him and took him to shock trauma and found out later it was a varicose vein mm -hmm. that was the size of my thumb. But when you walk into a room and you see nothing but blood everywhere, it doesn't matter if it's venous or arterial, you just stop it. Doesn't sure. It? So that's what we did. We the only thing is with a tourniquet, you know, you can actually make it worse because venous flow gets obstructed and you actually increase the pressure in the leg even more so that um, for an arterial bleeder, absolutely, that's the right solution. You know, if, and it's sometimes very hard to tell whether it's a venous bleeder. And venous bleeders are usually much, much harder to, to um, diagnose the origin from because it's not pulsatile. You know, when we have an arm laceration, and, and I would say 90% of the arm lacerations I get called in, there's some venous bleeder in the antecubital fossa, you know, from some idiot who put his arm through the glass window, and it's nothing special. Um, but you never know where it's coming from, uh, because venous blood just wells up. You know, you, you, you just, you have nothing that points you to the origin of it. And that's why it takes a little bit more time to find out. And it may be an arterial bleed underneath it, you don't know. You know, it becomes really, really, really difficult when you're in the abdomen, you deal with large veins because, because that just, this goes like a flood. And you have no idea where it's coming from and you have no idea how to fix it. You know, so we always prefer arterial bleeder over venous bleeders because it's, it's easier to, to find. You know. But the point is well taken. You know, the varicose veins are, are scary. And uh, no, they, are, they really are for patients. And uh, they, they're relatively easy to, to fix. And I always explain to them, if it happens to you again, just put your leg up. I give you an ACE bandage. You have that with you. And you wrap it if it happens again until we take care of your varicose veins. Can you talk about um, fistulas? We've had um, oh, yeah. fistulas yeah. that get bled. What do you do with those? Um, Can you describe what a fistula is in oh. more detail? Yeah, uh, I, you know what, I, I, don't, I didn't bring any things on that, I'm sorry. So, in people who have renal failure need to have uh, their blood cleansed because the kidneys are not doing it anymore. So there are different ways of, of having dialysis, which is uh, kidney treatments. There's peritoneal dialysis or there's hemodialysis. These are the only real two options you have. Peritoneal dialysis is through a catheter in their belly. And when you see those patients, when you come and you get a call on them, a catheter in the belly can be two things. It's either a suprapubic bladder catheter that they have in because they can't put it through the urethra and they have it surgically put in for chronic drainage of the urine or they have a peritoneal dialysis catheter in which actually helps them to dialyze and they dialyze themselves at home. They run in two liters of dialysate, let it dwell inside the abdomen and then after two hours let it run out. The nice thing about it is they can do it at home, they can do it themselves, they can do it with family, they're independent. They don't have to go every other day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, to sit four hours in a chair with a bunch of other people that are as sick as they are and, and you know, usually don't feel very well afterwards. Um, so a lot of the patients prefer peritoneal dialysis, but not everybody is eligible for it because the degree of renal function um, may require them to have more aggressive dialysis, and the only way they can get this is with hemodialysis. But hemodialysis, the weakest link in hemodialysis is the access, and that is the connection between the patient and the machine. And there are different ones. There's a tunnel catheter. which goes in through the IJ and is a temporary device because it's a piece of plastic tubing that, that hangs out somebody's chest. It gets tunneled under the skin, it hangs out. It has a blue port and it has a red port. And it gets hooked up to the machine. One sucks it out, brings it to the washing machine, washes the blood, and then returns it through the, through the red port, I think. Um, but it hangs out, so it's a plastic tube that hangs out, that can get infected, it can get stuck somewhere, it can fall out. So it's only a temporary device, an intermittent device that helps them to get from one place to the next, and the next place is a permanent access. The permanent access is hopefully 
uh, can you guys see this? Uh, um, is an AV fistula, which is a connection between an artery and a vein. So, veins have very thin walls, arteries have thick walls. Pressure in an artery is always higher than in a vein. So artery flow will always go towards the vein. Vein will never go towards artery, just because of the pressure and the flow differences. So by making a connection between the two, you force arterial flow into a vein. Veins dilate with pressure. And so after the fistula has been in for a few weeks, the vein hopefully dilates to the size that it can be felt and it can be seen in the arm. And I'll tell you where we go with this. And then it can get stuck with two needles um, to get dialysis. So that is the best possible arterial venous fistula you can create. In people, the anatomy of the Excuse my artistic thing. Bacillic vein, and there's a basilic vein in the forearm. And then this joins the, well, the basilic vein goes in, in the medial upper arm inside the upper arm. The cephalic vein runs on top of the biceps, goes like this. So in order to get the most real estate out of your fistula, you want to go near the wrist. And that's why most of the time we always start on the inside of the wrist right here with the cephalic vein. People get vein mapped. They have an ultrasound. We look at the veins. Are they the size of two, three millimeters? We use it. And then we transpose it to the radial artery, which is right here. It's a small over, and we sew the cephalic vein. To the radial artery, and then flow goes into the fistula, and then still goes to the hand. Uh, if that isn't good enough, you have diabetics. Uh, the radial arteries have calcium in it. They're small. They're they're not working well. You have lousy veins. People got stuck a million times. Um, so you have to find the best possible combination. So if this is not a good combination, you can also go up here and use the cephalic vein going to the brachial artery, or you can also do what we call a basilic vein transposition, where we actually take the basilic vein from here and transpose it onto the upper, on, onto the upper surface of the arm and sew it to the brachial artery. So um, there are various combinations. I don't want to bother you with the details. The key here is this. That arm cannot be used for venous sticks or blood pressure. You stick it, and in fact, funny you, you bring this up because this morning I walk into um, the room of a patient that I did a fistula yesterday. And uh, they always get a limb alert bracelet, which is pink. It has limb alert, which means da -da, don't stick me here. You know? So we have to take it off for the surgery. But after the surgery, the nurse is always supposed to put it back on. Well, on this guy, they forgot. But he had an incision of the wrist. He was on a heparin drip because he also has mitral valve disease and he can't be without anticoagulation. So lo and behold, at 6 o'clock in the morning, the, the phlebotomist walks in and guess what? Picks the left arm. The patient tells him, don't stick me here, don't stick me here. The phlebotomist says, no, I know what I'm doing. You know, I got to do this, I got to do this. And sticks him right here in the anticubital vein. And, you know, it was okay, but I went apeshit because, uh, you know, this is, this is terrible. This is really, this is like, shouldn't happen. And it happened. So uh, nobody ever touches the, the, these arms because you do so much damage to these patients and their chance of getting a good, good fistula. Um, blood pressure is also not good. It's not maybe that terrible, but sticking the arm for an IV is like a big, big no-no. First of all, you get into a lot of bleeding because all that, all that flow above the fistula is arterialized. So if they have a blood pressure of 140, they will bleed 140 out of that vein, and it's right under the skin. So uh, be very careful with that. The other thing is complication you run into this is, is uh, steel. And steel is exactly 
what it says, that the fistula steals blood away from the native circulation. So you most of the time, 99% of the time, you will always start with the fistula in the non-dominant arm. Because if they develop steel and they develop ischemia of the hand, um, you don't want this to be the dominant hand. So we always ask them, are you right or left hand dominant? And if they're saying I'm right hand dominant, we always look for the fistula first in the left arm. And if they do develop signs or symptoms of ischemia, which can be numbness, coldness in the hand, sometimes it only happens when they're on dialysis, uh, then you have to consider uh, fixing this. And I, if you want me to talk about it, I can do that too, but it goes into more detail of narrowing the fistula, so less flow goes to the fistula, more flow goes to the hand. You can also bypass it. Uh, it's called a drill procedure, distal uh, ligation, distal revascularization, interval ligation. Um, so various ways of doing it. In the end, sometimes you just have to tie it off because it's, it's, it's not salvageable and you, you never want to have loss of limb. There's one case in 27 years of me doing this where a lady lost her hand because of a fistula, of a graft. And it should never happen. It, it's, There, there, is, there is sometimes a one case actually where, where we, I was in favor of, of having the guy's hand taken off to salvage his fistula. And I will tell you that story because it's so extraordinary that the guy is still alive that um, it makes sense. This is a guy who's a diabetic, he's a smoker, he's on dialysis, he's blind, he drives this little scooter thing with a battery thing, and he always bumps into things because he can't see anymore. And he was driving for a long time even his car, even though he couldn't see anymore. And um, um, his name is Wayne. And Wayne and I got along really well because I tried to save le Wayne's legs for years. Uh, he had ulcers, he had gangrene, finally we, he decided to have both legs taken off below the knee and he walked with bilateral below the knee prosthesis. He could barely see, he could barely see, he had severe neuropathy in his hands and he had multiple access surgeries on his arm. And because he was blind from his diabetes, he once jammed his finger on something and injured his finger and, and it got gangrenous and the finger had to come off and he had a fistula in that arm. And he was dialyzing through that arm, but he had a steel from that fistula. So the plastic surgeon argued that I should ligate that fistula to save his finger and his hand. And we did an arteriogram, the arteriogram showed that he had such severe distal disease in his fingers that I thought even with me ligating the fistula he would never heal any amputations or surgeries. But um, you're in this conundrum, what are you going to do? And um, it ended up that um, I ligated the fistula, uh, he had the surgery, he lost uh, three fingers, he still had his thumb, and then that went bad, and I had the hardest time finding new access in his arm. And the question here was, you know, I'm risking his life by not getting dialysis for his hand that is non-functionally anyways. You know, he can't do anything with it. Um, and, um, you know, it, he's still alive, he had finally his hand amputated, I have a graft in his upper arm, and um, he's doing okay so far. But uh, th th those are difficult situations, difficult decisions to make. Um, for you, as when, when you see these people, uh, the, the, the indication here is that, that they have chronic renal failure, they're on dialysis, they're, they're unique p patients, they have chronic severe disease that is over the long haul deadly because people on dialysis have a, a much lower life expectancy to live 10 years than, than regular diabetic hypertensive tobacco abusers. Um, when you go on dialysis, uh, you're counting down. And uh, with exceptions, but for the most part that's true. So they all have chronic disease. There are very few people who have just renal failure. Because the renal failure has to come from something, whether it's hypertension, whether it's diabetes. Um, maybe some people had also, they're younger people, they had renal cancer, had an nephrectomy, 
and um, or gave their kidney to somebody else as a donor and now have problems with the left with the kidney that they have left. So you can't always assume these things, but for the most part in elderly people that is true, that they have chronic disease that makes them already very ill people. Okay. Anything else? Yes, sir. That's that's a very good question too, because um, after carotid endarterectomy, we check the repair six weeks after the surgery, and then we check it six months after the surgery, and everything is fine. We check them every year. Um, I've seen it come back within six months. I had um, a lady who, um, and actually she was patched. She was kind of crazy case, but uh, yes, they can come back very quickly. And you cannot really sit on it for too long because uh, they usually get a pretty severe stenosis and you really need to take them back and redo it. Yes, sir? the time you know they uh, after this the carotid bodies sit right in the bifurcation they control blood pressure so a lot of times people come um, out of surgery they're either hypertensive or they're hypotensive so they get a routine drip of either nicotapine or neosinephrine ordered and then we titrate it to um, blood pressure less 150 systolic um, uh, or 110 or greater than 110 uh, systolic um, Right, and I'm getting to that. Right, so then it kind of usually works itself out within 12 hours, and uh, they usually a lot of times go home without any blood pressure medications because a lot of times the blood pressure is lower. And then after a week or so, um, they usually hypertension is coming back, and they need to go back on their usual medications. They don't necessarily need more antihypertensive therapy. Um, we're not worried about blowing out the the, um, the the repair site because the adventitia is incredibly tough. It's one of the it's the strongest layer, and you look at it and you think, man, this looks really flimsy. But it it uh, it holds a stitch, it holds the blood pressure, it doesn't blow out. Uh, if it blows out, it's it's uh, we we did something wrong. It, it shouldn't blow out. Um, so in, in the long run, uh, there, there is usually not a change in the, in the antihypertensive uh, therapy. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks.